today? No. Here we go. Good afternoon, Pam. Hello, Carla. How are you? I'm well, thank you. It's a real privilege to have you uh, on this chit chat this afternoon. And I'd just like to begin by uh, sharing with our listeners a little bit about your um, extensive bio and history, just so that they understand um, the nature of expert we have um, zooming in from Australia with us this afternoon. So it is my privilege this afternoon to introduce to you Professor Pamela Snow, who is a Professor of Cognitive Psychology in the School of Education at the Bendigo campus of La Trobe University in Australia. Pamela is a registered psychologist, having qualified originally in speech language pathology and has taught a wide range of undergraduate and postgraduate education and health professionals. In 2020, Pamela established with her colleague, Associate Professor Tanya Seri, the Science of Language and Reading, or some of us may know it as the Solar Lab, in the School of Education at La Trobe University. Pamela's research has been published in a wide range of international journals, and she was a member of the 2017 National Year One Literacy and Numeracy Panel. She is a life member of Speech Pathology Australia and a past Victorian State Chair of the Australian Psychological Society. Pamela has over 170 publications comprising Refer refereed papers, books and book chapters, monographs and research reports. And many of you will be very familiar with her The Snow Report, and she is also a founding associate editor of the Reading League Journal. My goodness me, welcome. It is an absolute privilege, as I said earlier, to have you joining us to Thank offer you. a little bit of insight into, um, I'm going to say, um, giving us a little bit of a, a state of the nation as to potentially why this shift in reading education is so important for our children and then perhaps how we can help them um, to be being prepared to become readers um, and into that reading process. So yeah, it's great to have you here. It's a pleasure to be with you. So um, I do have the questions that I sent through to you and we have had a few other people um, email and message and um, some questions too, which I think will be really useful for everybody who's listening in. So the first question that I'd like to jump in with is, um, don't all teachers teach reading the same way? So a lot of parents I imagine would believe that if their child went to school at school A and school B or school C, that reading education could be the same from school to school. Mm. And you would be, um, it, it would be reasonable for parents to think that. Um, however, unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, and someone said, and it's a line that I quote, but it, I can't um, take credit for it, that parents unfortunately buy a ticket in a lottery when they send their children to school. Because in all innocence, when you send your child to the local primary school, state school, whatever terminology you use, um, it is fair to assume, um, mm. A, that your child is going to be taught to read and that they're going to be taught to read in the most rigorous um way that is informed by the best current scientific evidence. Unfortunately, what happens, um, and this varies, of course, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, some are more prescriptive about what goes on in their schools. Some sectors in Australia, for example, are, are more prescriptive, some are less prescriptive. But as a generalisation, we can say that there's a lot of variability um, at a school level, even in some respects at a classroom level within schools, mm. um, as a function of how teachers were taught themselves in their teacher pre-service education and how they interpret the evidence, what they're comfortable with, what they feel familiar with, what they feel has worked for them in the past. One of the biggest issues, I think, is that we, we seem to have landed um, in many cases on something called balanced literacy, which sounds so reassuring and, and mm. perfect that, um, you know, of course, in all things in our lives, we want balance. We want to have a balanced lifestyle. We want to eat a balanced diet. 
um, we want the tyres on our car to have balanced air pressure. <laughs> you know, what's wrong with them? Um, balance. Um, yeah. But the problem is that balanced literacy really <coughs> grew out of an approach mm -hmm. called whole language that in turn came out of the United States in the particularly 1980s. It probably started a bit earlier than that, but especially in the 1980s and was adopted with a lot of enthusiasm and not a lot of critical analysis in countries like Australia and New Zealand. Mm. Um, and it, it kind of fitted with the spirit of the times, really. There was a whole lot of social upheaval that was occurring from the 70s onwards that made us throw out a lot of old institutions and want to do things in a in a new um a new way and whole language sort of fitted with that unfortunately whole language had as an underlying principle the idea that learning to read is as natural as learning to mm. speak um and we know that that's not the case they're, they're just uh, um I, mean, I won't go into the the boring nuts and bolts of the um cognitive psychology evidence around that but we know that oral language is something that we humans have evolved a special capacity for um, but and so we call it, we call oral language something that's biologically primary where reading writing and spelling are things that are biologically secondary mm. that we <clears throat> go to school to be taught so going back to your question though um, so whole language kind of took hold in schools and then there was uh, but but the way that we teach reading has been controversial for a long time if you really go back into the history of this it's been controversial for more than 100 years some would say even more and it, and it mm. has been a bit of a pendulum going back and forth um, it's not just is, is, yeah so is that because we haven't had the evidence or has that been because we'd we'd um, had an ideology presented to us and that by the time we came to the evidence the ideology was so ingrained in practices across the globe that was really difficult to change that practice or so why is it that you think it's a good, there has it's a good been question. this uncertainty? I think um, mm -hmm. it, it's not really that we haven't had the evidence but there has been a knowledge translation problem so there's been a problem of going um, from the um, the research laboratory if you like into the classroom and one of the problems has been that a lot of the research done on what reading is as a cognitive process and how children learn mm -hmm. to read has been done by cognitive psychologists by people not actually in the education discipline. And I think probably people on both sides of the fence need to take some responsibility here. So perhaps the cognitive psychologists and, and neuroscientists haven't done the very best job that they could have in translating that for right. teacher educators. Yes. But also perhaps teacher educators have been a bit resistant to new knowledge that's come from another paradigm. So it hasn't come yes. from faculties of education. It's mm. come from schools of psychology and um, neuroscience faculties mm. and, and so forth. Um, so so we, we, we went along with this whole language um, ideology and it really was an ideology. It, it didn't have and doesn't have a research science to back it. Um, and then there was significant unrest, again, that started in the US but was occurring in other English-speaking countries as well about the fact that children's reading performance wasn't improving. In fact, in many cases, it was going backwards. And in the US have been monitoring this quite closely through the NAEP, the National Assessment, yes. National Progress. Um, uh, so, that, you know, they've had the data to see what was happening. And so in the year 2000, the US convened um, the National Reading Panel, uh, which was um, basically a federal inquiry into how reading is taught. We had a national inquiry here in 2005 that was led by the late Dr Ken Rowe and uh, the UK had its um, national inquiry led by Sir Jim Rose. Mm. All of those 
national inquiries quite independently reach the same conclusion that in order to ensure that the overwhelming majority of children, and here we're talking, you know, in the vicinity of 95% plus, mm. the overwhelming majority of children need to be taught in a way that um, is explicit and structured and systematic. None of those um, three national inquiries recommended a thing called balanced literacy. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, it's fair to say that there's been some clever quote mining of the recommendations of those national inquiries and people have kind of cobbled together a mm. narrative that says that we should be doing balanced literacy because, of, of course, none of them also said you should only do phonics and you should only yes. do explicit phonics. They mm. also talked about the importance of vocabulary, of rich language exposure, of comprehension, of fluency, you know, the whole package. But mm. the point of departure, if I had to boil it down to the simplest essence, I think the point of departure is between how children are, are taught about the code um, of the English writing system and, and indeed in some cases whether they're taught about the code of mm. the English writing system um, in the first couple of years of being at school and Balanced literacy advocates say things like, oh, yes, phonics is in the mix. You know, we, we, we do everything. Um, but if you go into a balanced literacy classroom, one of the biggest problems with balanced literacy, in fact, is that it doesn't have an agreed definition. So mm. you can go into two adjacent classrooms in the same school and both teachers are saying that they're doing balanced literacy but doing vastly different things. So that's mm. why we have this lottery element for yeah. parents um, and I think it's in parents' interests to drill down on what the approach is that's being taken in a school that they're considering sending their child to and turning over some rocks to find out mm. um, what that school is actually doing with respect to teaching reading. Mm. And so if you were to, just to help parents who, because we know the response pretty much they're going to, to get is they might hear things like, we teach a balanced literacy mm. approach. It's important yep. that we teach yep. our children about phonics and comprehension. Yep. So my thinking too is that if you hear the word phonics in isolation, that there should potentially be alarm bells um, because it could be sitting um, right out to the side. And, the, and what else they might hear is uh, um, isolated statements like we teach children to read for meaning. Yes. And, then on, and then on the flip side to that, they might go into a school um, that is one of our um, leading lights currently across New Zealand who say we teach a structured literacy approach. Mm -hmm. We identify children's needs from school entry. We determine their starting point for teaching. And then we teach them very systematically through a scope and sequence, mm -hmm. teaching them um, the alphabetic principle code and taking that from simple to complex in sound, word, sentence, yep. text, all the while building vocabulary morphology and leading into comprehension and they're completely different beasts <laughs> they're yes. completely different classrooms they require completely different knowledge and skill sets for teachers so teachers mm. can't seamlessly go from a balanced literacy environment where the focus is on um, meaning from the outset to that uh, very structured, explicit scope and sequence environment. Mm. They don't have the skills in or the knowledge base in most cases in order to do that. If mm. I can just um, unpack a couple of those points. Sure. Here, Carla, uh, this idea that um, reading is a meaning-based activity, so therefore we start with meaning, has some kind of face appeal, particularly for people who perhaps haven't done a lot of um, their own sort of background research on the reading process. But I'd like to unpack that a little bit. I think um, people on all sides of the reading debate agree that the purpose of reading is to understand mm -hmm. the text. Absolutely. What are we doing? Um, exactly. So that we can put on the table and say, yes, we agree on mm. it. Now, where we diverge is then on the starting point and um, whole language and balanced literacy advocates have been reluctant to deal with the fact that writing is a code. Mm. 
that we have spoken language that children have this biological advantage for and they start doing, you know, babies start cooing and babbling in the first six months of mm. life. And then amazingly, by the time children go to school at the age of five, they're talking in, you know, connected discourse, telling stories and explaining the rules of games. And, you know, it's, it's phenomenal what happens in the oral mm. space in the first five years of life. But then, so that's the biologically natural part. But then when they go to school, we ask them to cross a metaphorical bridge and do something that's biologically unnatural, which is deal with written text. So whilst we have a reading brain because of how we've, sorry, a, a language brain because of how we've evolved as a species, we don't have a reading brain. Mm. So we're not going to learn to read, write and spell without mm. instruction in the same way that we learn to talk and listen um, without actual explicit instruction. So, so that, that's, you know, that's a major um, kind of stumbling point. Mm. But then we have to deal with the nature of the writing system that we have in English. So not only is written text a code, um, so when we moved to writing systems approximately 5,000 years ago, we had to work out, and there was a lot of trial and error on this, but we had to work out the best way to codify spoken language and different languages have done that differently. If you look at Chinese and Japanese, for example, it's a very different code. Um, and uh, one of the ways that we talk about alphabetic languages like English is how transparent they are. Mm. And because of the history of English and the fact that we've greedily gobbled up words from other languages mm. just because we like them we've said you know thanks that's pretty we'll have that and we'll have that one <laughs> but we've taken words from other languages and it, we've taken their spellings at the same time um, initially of course we also took their pronunciations and we've ended up with a, a writing system or the technical term that's used is orthography a way of representing language in writing we've ended up with a writing system that we can only say is semi-transparent so languages like Italian and Spanish and Finnish have got a one-to-one -one correspondence between mm. sounds and letters. And if anyone's learnt one of those languages, they'll know that they're delightfully straightforward. You've got to put in some effort, but they're delightfully straightforward. But if you're learning English as a second language learner, um, you, you know, it's incredibly frustrating because of the inconsistencies in our written code because it, it is only semi-transparent. So, um, you know, if you take a word like night, K-N-I-G-H-T, which we took from Anglo-Saxon um, tribes quite early on in the history of English, and we brought that across as it would have been originally pronounced, knicht. Um, so all of the sounds in the word were mm. originally pronounced. We've kept the spelling, but the pronunciation has shifted. So sometimes mm. people think that, the problem with English is its tricky spellings. It's not the problem at all. The, the problem with English is that pronunciations have yes. shifted, that spelling has stayed um, pretty static, particularly once the um, printing press came into play and then later um, we had the advent of early dictionaries. Samuel Johnson and Noah Webster, you know, bedded down spellings, um, but those early lexicographers when they compiled dictionaries. So we've, we've got an imperfect code. We have to accept that um, the way we write in English, it is a code, but it's an imperfect code. And we can't expect children to intuit that code they've got to be mm. taught the code now where balanced literacy and structured literacy instruction deviate really is on how we're going to get children having mastery after three years of formal schooling of that code balanced literacy advocates say we'll immerse children in lots of text we'll read to them a lot um, we'll use predictable leveled readers um, we'll teach them banks of sight words and that's how we'll get them there and that works for some children it works mm. for probably a significant proportion of children nobody knows exactly how many structured literacy um, instruction advocates say well this code is complex 
learned scholars have been tinkering with it for hundreds and hundreds mm. of years. We've got five-year-olds in front of us and we're giving them 36 months to learn how this complex writing system works. Let's do it in a structured, explicit way so that we're not leaving reading to mm. chance. Mm. Um, so the idea is particularly for children who are in the tail of the curve for some reason, who are struggling more on school entry for you know, what could be any one of a number of yes. reasons, that we're creating a really tight safety net that also benefits the more able students because they get a, a richer, deeper understanding of how their writing system works mm. when they're taught in this way, which later on becomes important when they're um, moving into the middle primary school years and we want them to be learning about um, etymology, the uh, study yes. of word origins, um, which really helps them to identify word families and see patterns in spelling and, and so forth. And, in fact, that's the other really important piece of about structured literacy instruction that it teaches the code as a reversible process so when we're mm. teaching reading in an explicit thorough way we're also in the same process teaching writing and spelling and mm. so um, we're not just not leaving reading to chance but we're also not leaving writing to chance Mm. So there's some really nice key um, indicators in terms of what parents would look out for too if they, if they weren't brave enough to go in and ask the school yep. based on what their child is bringing home, yep. they will, you know, having listened to you, they will be able to start to gain some insight as to whether or not their child might be learning through a balanced, mm. limited, limited structure approach. Yep or a very structured literacy approach where they are being taught the code and other skills from simple to complex. And also knowing how crucial those skills are in those first three years of school. Mm. So that, because we know from an education perspective that if children after three years have somewhat fluid access to those skills, that really does open up the curriculum across many different learning areas too, which we know then increases their vocabulary and helps to build their intellect. And so it does seem somewhat counterproductive to take a risk for the first three years and not teach in a very systematic way because what we're experiencing here in New Zealand at the moment is the schools that are embarking on you know, first that professional learning for teachers and then going into implementing a systematic structured literacy approach, they have children that are moving very, very quickly through that process. Mm. And they possibly are the children who might have been able to do some of those self-teach things in a balanced literacy approach. And But that's fine. They can still move really quickly. But they are having so much more success at enabling those students who... I'm going to just be brave enough to say would never have become readers and writers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Never. Absolutely. And, and what they become instead is children with behaviour problems. Yeah. Um, children who experience shame and embarrassment mm. um, in the face of the fact that they can't read. Children who spend a lot of time off task in classrooms, distracting mm. other children, um, avoiding reading and writing tasks. And, you know, you were talking a moment ago about the importance of, you know, um, being able to engage with an increasingly complex curriculum. Yes. You can't do that if you can't no, read. If you, you can't, can't pick up a book in grade four and actually um, read long, complex sentences that maybe don't have pictures attached mm. to them um, and, um, and contain words that you haven't seen before that you need to be able to decode in order to identify them, then mm. you're going to be dispirited and think that reading is a pretty irrelevant, tedious, unrewarding thing mm. to do. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, ironically, in order for children to um, develop the vocabulary that they need in order to keep up with the curriculum, they've got to be reading mm. increasingly complex mm. books. In order to be reading increasingly complex books, they've got to have ongoing strong language skills that include mm. decoding. So, you know, we've got this curriculum yeah. and my argument is let's try and take decoding out of the mix early on as a, as a problem 
if we give kids full access to the code, the toolkit that enables them to crack the code, mm. then we're removing a barrier to getting to the meaning of the text because mm. you can you can decode text um, that you can't understand. So I learned French at school for six years a long time ago. <laughs> you gave me a text of um, a page of text written in French. I can still decode it in the sense that I can lift it off the page, but I can't tell you much about what it means because I've forgotten a lot of my vocabulary. Yeah, yeah. But you can't understand something that you can't decode. So I'm, mm. I'm part of the way there with French because I can remember some decoding. But if I had no decoding, like if you gave me a page of text in Arabic and I don't understand how that writing system works or Hebrew or mm. Cyrillic Russian language, if I don't understand the writing system, I can't get to the meaning. Mm. You know, Absolutely. Game yeah. over. Mm, it is game over. You mentioned earlier about mastery after three years at school. I just want to pick up on this because mm -hmm. in some respects here in New Zealand, I, I feel that we still have an underlying um, presence of a wait to fail approach. Yeah. And <clears throat> I think that's, you know, an area that hopefully in the years to come when we see a wider adoption and a wider acceptance or wider acceptance and then a wider adoption and of structured literacy um, to understand that it's about building those strong foundation literacy skills to reach the end game of comprehension and access of curriculum but in your experience what happens for those children who don't reach mastery after three years mm, it's not trivial at all actually um, my Australian colleague and um, some um, some of people in your um, audience would be familiar with the work of Dr. Kerry Hempenstall mm. is a semi-retired educational mm. developmental psychologist from RMIT and um, he may not be the person who first identified this but I, I um, associate this with one of Kerry's papers in which he said it takes four times as many resources to resolve a reading problem by year four than it would have taken in year one mm. so we yeah. must not be waiting to fail and we must be making the absolute most of really every hour of instructional mm. time mm. in that first three years. I mean, in all of children's schooling, but, you know, yeah. about literacy. Um, and we also need to remember that, you know, even the most talented, experienced, competent early years teacher can't tell with any level of certainty <laughs> which children are going to get across that bridge quite seamlessly mm. um, and which ones won't. So mm. that really affirms the need to get the instruction right and to have a tight safety net yeah. so that we're not leaving children behind. But we know that it can be quite diabolical because if you get to grade three, which in our system and I suspect in yours as well is the fourth year of formal schooling and mm -hmm. you're still struggling with early decoding that means that um, you, you're not ready for the level of independence that that shift from learning to read to reading to learn necessitates mm. in middle primary <clears throat> school years um, you're expending too much cognitive effort on decoding um, on trying to access words so that's going to slow down your fluency and if you're not fluent, you're not going to be understanding what you're reading. And you're also not going to be motivated, as I was saying, mm. um, to read. Now, when children start on predictable leveled readers, that, um, you know, it's a little bit cruel in some ways, I think. It is. It's because, very cruel. Um, because <laughs> they look like they're reading fluently quite mm. early. But in fact, if we look closely, what they're doing is reciting. So they're seeing the stem of a sentence, I like to spend time with. Um, and then on the other page, it says, um, my mum, and there's a picture of mum. And then mm. we the page, I like to spend time with my dad, um, you know, my brother, my sister, my grandmother, whatever. Um, and so if, if you actually watch what's happening with those children's eyes, um, it's not on the text at all. No. 
and they're not learning transferable skills. Um, so yeah, well, when we teach systematically, we're teaching children transferable skills so that if they can decode um, the word like, for example, they can decode the word Mike mm. um, when they come across that person's name because mm. um, we've taught them transferable skills. But learning how to read with predictable texts and banks of sight words we, we reach a ceiling very quickly, but we do so creating the illusion of reading. And mm. um, a US researcher back in the 1960s, Jean Chul, referred to the year three slump. Mm. Um, you know, th th these kids are like souffles. They look like they were rising beautifully. <laughs> yeah, it's a great analogy. Collapse in the middle. Yeah. You know, that must be so unnerving for teachers mm. and parents and so anxiety provoking and resource intensive because we just don't have the resources. Absolutely. To, to pick these kids up and backfill three years of schooling. Mm. It just, again, it seems so counterproductive as we're sitting here talking about this. For us, it seems so logical and I think when we're privileged enough to work alongside parents and talk them through in more detail about a structured literacy approach so often they will turn around and say but it just makes so much sense exactly and, parents can and see that. yeah and and as I'm talking with you now you know and we're sort of talking about fundamentally that if you build up my ability to be able to lift words off the page with increasing relative ease fundamentally as I go through my schooling years schooling years you're going to help free the cognitive load in my brain to be yeah. able to access all of those other things so there's no there is no debate here there is no pendulum swing around comprehension and meaning and vocabulary no, being taken no. out of the equation the, the yeah. The concern is, in terms of what approach our children are being taught in schools, it's we have pretty much two options at play. We have one option that you termed so aptly as a lottery, and, you know, children will be going in and they will pick up a book and that book will be what we call an authentic or a level text. That's what I call a mishmash of language. Yep. And really those children haven't been taught all of the sounds in those words. And there will be a lot of guessing because what else can you do if you haven't mm. been taught those things? Mm. Absolutely. And there'll be a lot of telling and then hoping that you'll bank that. And in my experience, I would tell him one word on one page and then be quite sort of brassed off if he didn't remember it when mm. it popped up on the next page. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Compared to the structured literacy approach where we don't leave anything to chance, we teach from simple to complex in a systematic way. And we're not doing that to slow down our children as developing readers. In fact, quite the opposite. We're doing it to ensure that successful reading and that network is built in the brain. And further to that, that all children will end up being able to access the curriculum and literacy mm. as they move into ad adolescence and adulthood. Absolutely. I will say that, um, and I hear this a lot from teachers, um, and I think it's entirely plausible that um, teaching the code in a structured explicit way remembering that English has a complex code it's mm. a semi-transparent code um, it probably is a bit slower initially than giving children banks of sight words and predictable mm. texts that make them look fluent even though what they're doing is not actually mm. reading but reciting and you know if you've learned the word chair as a sight word well, that's fine, but then when you come across chop, you know, you've got nothing because you don't yeah, understand yeah. orthographic mm. connections. Um, yeah. so, um, uh, so teachers do and parents need to be prepared for the fact that this can appear a bit slower because mm. they're actually learning a, a biologically unnatural skill and they're learning it properly and we're getting yes. all of the cogs to turn but then there's a tipping point and they can, um, and David Shear, a, a reading researcher, talks about the self-teaching hypothesis. Mm, um, mm. If we give kids enough of the code, most of them then go, right, yep, got it, and um, mm. you're away. We don't actually have to explicitly teach yeah. all of the code. 
Um, but the other point I'd like to come back to of yours, Carla, is that this isn't new. Mm-hmm. Jean Chaul, who described the year three slump, she was writing in the 1960s when I was wow. learning how to read. <laughs> So we've known this for a very long time. Mm. We've had three national inquiries. In Australia, no state or territory adopted the recommendations of our, uh, the 20 recommendations from our 2005 national inquiry. So, you know, shame on us, really, that Mm. we we could have been shifting the needle. Absolutely. um, Much, much more than we have. We can't. Um, attach blame to parents families communities ethnic backgrounds you know none of that cuts any ice here children Mm. learn as Anita Archer who's an explicit instruction um, can I use the word guru and then yeah I've had a chat chat with her a couple of months ago um, education researcher and practitioner says you know if children haven't learnt it we haven't taught it exactly Mm. Yeah. So in terms of um, if if you were giving advice to parents, one of the questions that's come in from a parent is, as a parent, what do you think a parent can do to encourage uh, schools to change how they take to reading? It's a big question. It is a big big question. question. But if there was one thing that you you know, or one place you could point them to, what what would you suggest? I mean, obviously, we're going to say that that parent's going to go in um, in a respectful way to maintain relationships and all of those yes, sorts of things. Of course, but of course, yeah, what yeah. what would you Look, suggest? I think, if um, does? I, I mean, I think support of the school leadership is very important in this journey. If um, the really successful transitions I've seen have been ones that have, if not been led by school leadership, had mm. the support and enthusiastic support of school leadership so where principals say look I don't know a lot about this space but Mary Lou is the literacy (laughs) leader and I trust her and I'm going if she says that we need to be buying decodable texts I'll sign the check Um, yeah so you you need leadership support Mm. Um, but I often refer people to Emily Hanford's writings as a starting point I'm sure you're familiar with Emily yes yeah US um, journalist with um, APM, American Public Media, and she's really made reading and reading instruction her own in the last um, probably four or five years. And her first piece was called Hard Words. Mm. Um, and, uh, and there's, I um, uh, can never remember what the next one's called, which is un- unpacking the problems with three queuing or multi queuing. And Mm -hmm. then she wrote a third piece called What the Words Say, which is about um, working with young people in youth detention and, um, you know, the awful stories that they've had in the school-to-prison pipeline. Yeah. Um, And in each case there's an essay and there's also a podcast Mm. that that goes with it. And they're not, you know, the podcast isn't just the um, the essay read out. It's a a conversation. It's an interview. Mm. But um, asking principals to read hard words, um, I I think, is a good place to start. Yeah, I agree. Linking Mm. a school up with another similar school, similar demographic um, that has gone down this journey and seeing if they can go and visit um, the classrooms, talk to the teachers, find out what the teachers are noticing about the progress that children are making. I've worked with teachers who've taught prep for, well, we, we used to call it prep here in Victoria. We now call it foundation. Some states call it reception, first year of school. Um, so I've, I've talk, worked with um, teachers who've taught children in that first year for 30 years and they've made this difficult shift. <laughs> and there's no question that yeah. many teachers that Absolutely. Is. And they say, I cannot believe what five-year-olds can do. Mm. Um, I'm not I'm not used to seeing this level of reading proficiency until you know halfway through the end of uh, or to the end of grade two. Um, and of course, you know, that brings a lot of very mixed and sometimes quite yeah. difficult emotions for teachers too, when they realize that you know, sometimes for decades the children that they've been teaching mm. actually have been doing so much better. Mm. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So really um, what you've just to sort of summarize that, what you've said is the importance of um, building strong relationships with school leaders and then sharing information with them. Yeah. And yeah. I, I completely agree with you. Uh, I think of the schools here in New Zealand that have made a really, really high quality, sustainable shift that's now embedded in these schools in all cases, those school principals have really, really been pivotal. And like you say, they may not, they may not have ended up at the end of the journey with the same extensive knowledge or practice experience than their teaching staff do, but they absolutely know um, what they're doing and why they're doing this. And yeah. they understand the importance of, uh, you know, some, some resourcing shifts that have needed to occur along the way as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of the other questions that, that has come in, and I, I sort of feel like we have touched on this a wee bit, but how can we safely warn parents and schools about the myriad of snake oil interventions out there for our children with, um, with learning difficulties? So this question has directly come from someone who has um, read or read part of um, uh, um, a text that I understand you co-authored Making Sense of Interventions for Children mm -hmm. with Developmental Disorders mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. um, so what was the first part of the question the um, first part was how can we safely warn parents mm -hmm. and schools right. yeah about the myriad of snake oil oh, okay. interventions yes yeah, yeah. Look, I think um, once schools become properly aware of the science of reading, for want of a better term, mm. um, then they have a, a very good sort of early warning system for what aligns with that scientific approach and what doesn't. And they know the questions to ask if they're not sure and they know who to ask if they're not mm. sure. Um, but... Um, you, you know, you're right, and the person who's asked this question is right. There is a lot of snake oil out there. Um, developmental disorders of all kinds, including reading difficulties, are mm. what someone's described as a magnet for pseudoscience. Mm. Um, and, you know, someone with a cash register um, in their front office who just wants to make a buck um, out of parent anxiety and school anxiety in some cases too. Mm. Um, so I I think it is very important to be discerning in the marketplace, um, to not rush into making any decisions, to asking around, looking beyond testimonials. Um, yeah. If there's a research tab on a website, making sure that, you know, it links to actual research and, you know, they were talking about peer-reviewed papers in the academic literature, not magazine articles. You know, mm. A lot of traps for young players in this space in the sense mm. that there's a lot of smoke and mirrors, I suppose, in <laughs> making things look authentic when they're actually not. Mm. Um, but, but once schools go down this path, they're much less vulnerable um, yeah, and agree. prone to pseudoscience and to mm. snake oil because, you know, they need some upfront investment in teacher professional learning. They need to invest in decodable or phonically controlled texts to support their early instruction. But this needn't actually be a big um, item of expenditure on the school budget because the biggest resource is the knowledgeable teacher. Absolutely. You know, then if he or she has got butcher's paper and um, textures um, mm. or a whiteboard um, and uh, whiteboard <laughs> markers, you know, they, they can do this. They don't need um, expensive commercial products. Absolutely. Like, I do yeah. get annoyed sometimes when people say, oh, you know, phonics um, follow the money. It's all about commercial interests. Well, mm. it's actually not. It's actually about giving teachers back the knowledge that has been systematically a Eroded out of teacher pre-service education Absolutely. for decades. And, you know, if anyone's looked at what these international publishing houses charge schools for sets of levelled readers lately, if you want to say follow the money, um, you know, that they're not donated to schools. Yeah. Um, they're very, very expensive. Mm. 
Mm, I agree with you and I think that's one thing we and I did have a chit chat um I think it was a couple of months ago now with Anita Archer oh and I think right. I, yeah and I and then um ironically after her I had Dr Lorraine Hammond which oh, was ama an amazing <laughs> follow-on yeah. yeah but I think I was sharing with um with Anita that my own experience of sort of growing up in the last, um, I don't know, eight or nine years into structured literacy has been how much that has improved my teaching practice because of the explicit instruction component. Mm -hmm. And when you mm -hmm. really, truly know how to teach, I believe mm -hmm. that you you can do that with very minimal resourcing. And um, absolutely, yeah, and I, I, you know, if I'm, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And knowing where to go and when to fold back and why to fold back, because yes. you understand the yes. science that sits behind the development of the reading brain. And mm. it's a really, it's a really, really empowering seat to sit in. And I'm, and I'm really proud to say that many more teachers across New Zealand and many more parents, you know, we, gosh, we have some amazing uh, knowledgeable parents across this exactly. country too now, which is which is fantastic. And, and together, hopefully that can drive that continued um, that continued groundswell. Mm -hmm. My goodness, it has been it's been great. I feel like we could sit here until the cows come home, as good. we might say in this little <laughs> rural town. But um, I know that you've had a really big day of, of online meetings and you'll probably be wanting to get that mask on and go for a walk outside and get oh, some fresh. I wish. <laughs> If um, we could finish, um, if we could finish, Pam, with just maybe you know your three top tips for for anybody who's listening that is really passionate about supporting this shift in literacy education across New Zealand, what would your three key pointers be to them? Okay. Uh, well, firstly, I would say remember that this is a journey. It's not something that you can flip overnight. Mm. So you've got to be prepared to sustain um, a deep knowledge change, a deep shift in teacher knowledge. And that's going to mean potentially overcoming some resistance, some emotional responses um and doubt um so be prepared for this not to be flicking a switch it, it needs to be gradual and incremental um but if you stay the course um you will see enormous benefits um i would say be mindful of the fact that um phonics ain't phonics um to hark back to an old um tv ad about oils ain't oils um, but there's, there's phonics and phonics so for parents I would say don't be reassured by a school saying you know something like phonics is in the mix or we do phonics keep asking questions what kind of phonics we mm. haven't really talked today about the difference between for example synthetic mm. and analytic yeah. phonics. Um, so there are different approaches to phonics and I would certainly advocate systematic synthetic phonics as being the most efficient and rigorous um, and we certainly don't want phonics instruction to be in any way um, incidental um, in that, especially in the first couple of years. Mm. Um, gosh, I'm only allowed to have three. Um, I, I, would say, <laughs> I, I would say remember that reading and writing should be taught as reversible processes. Mm. And we, we kind of gave up on spelling um, in the, with whole language and balanced literacy because, again, teachers didn't know how to teach it. So it was, oh, you know, just let kids invent their own spelling. And that's been a disaster. Um, so we'll get wins with spelling as well um, as, a, as a windfall, really, if we mm. get reading instruction right. Mm, absolutely thank you so much very wise words indeed and um I'd just like to reiterate what you've said about that last piece I think one of the biggest shifts that we're seeing currently with teachers in classrooms is really understanding the reciprocity between that relationship of reading and writing mm. coupling that really as literacy and being really skilled in their practice with that decoding code decode um, process because they understand how significant that is as the children come into more complex tasks so mm. thank you so much for joining us this sure. afternoon I'm and I'm really that. I'm really sure that people have taken a lot of great things away there's been a couple of key words that you've mentioned that I'd just like to finish on and earlier in our chat 
you talked about the fact that there had been these national inquiries in three different countries across the globe. And many people will know here in New Zealand, we had a wonderful research project completed, um, I'm going to say, and, and was released either 2015 and 2016. And that has led definitely to um, the ministry starting to have a core focus on the teaching of foundation literacy skills. Our challenge now here in New Zealand is to build evidence-based consistent shared understandings across our government, ministry officials, and the experts that are out in the field, and other organisations such as Lifting Literacy Aotearoa, so that everybody is on the same page with what that quality of instruction and mm. um, delivery should look like. And of course, then with our teacher training institutions too, because of course, if we could have the influence um, and when I say we, I'm talking about if our teaching council could influence um, um, the quality of teacher um, pre-service instruction so that teachers came out of teacher training colleges with this knowledge that would make a really big difference um, to that Definitely. shift going forward. But the thing that is still at hand here in New Zealand, like it is in many other country, is that that translation problem that you referred to earlier, sadly, is still alive and well. And I just want to thank you on behalf of all of your followers here in New Zealand for your extensive work and your commitment to really helping us to to dilute that translation problem and actually get it sped up and help spread the good word um, right oh, across thanks, our country Helen. and into yours. We, we learn a lot from, you know, we're not always, we're not always um, that willing to be um, best friends with our Aussie <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but when we it comes to this matter, no, we won't talk about cricket or rugby, although the rugby was quite good in the weekend. Um, but yeah, you know, um, we know, right, that the reading brain is the reading brain is the Absolutely. reading brain. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. and and that's where it's a real privilege to be able to to partner with um, international experts such as yourself to help sort out that translation crisis. Well, it's so, been delightful to chat with you this afternoon, Carla, and let's hope, as they say over at the Reading League in the United States, that a rising tide lifts all boats um, and you do better and we do better um, mm. and, and we become more literate nations and more civically engaged yeah. nations and less prone to fake news and... Mm. Uh, you know li literacy has enormous civic benefits it really well. does yeah thank you so much and thank you to everybody who's tuned in to um listen today to professor pamela snow next month i'm going to be chit chatting with uh one of new zealand's um highly regarded um school leaders about implementation of structured literacy she's just come out the other end after a three-year journey of implementing structured literacy and has got some really great tips and tools that she's going to share so i think that's going to be a really nice follow-on um, from our chat today so looking forward to seeing everybody then